Good morning and welcome to the Angry Astronaut. Got the content coming to you fast and furious as always because there is so much happening right now. Quick update for you. We've raised about a third of the money already in a short span of time of what I'm going to need in order to tour the Dynetics facilities and their new version of Alpaca. If that's something you're interested in supporting, the links are in the description. Thank you so much everybody for your support and making it possible for me to continue on the spot up close and personal coverage instead of just covering things from this room right here, which frankly is all I'd be able to do without you. So thanks so much for that. So what about H3? What about JAXA? What about Japan's contribution to Artemis? I mean, as you can see from the title of this video, I'm claiming that Japan's Artemis mission is starting tonight. Assuming, of course, that the rocket gets off the ground. And Japan has had a long and frustrating journey with this rocket, mostly as a result of the extremely innovative engines that they're using. Yeah, Japan actually has a unique engine um, that's powering this particular rocket. And even though it increases its efficiency and all of the modifications on this engine makes for a much more powerful hydrogen hydrogen and oxygen fueled combination, which generally doesn't work very well for engines that are trying to lift off from sea level. But all of that having been the case, it's led to lots of problems too. But that's about the only innovation we're looking at on this rocket. I mean, it's expendable, right? Fully expendable, really not a whole lot better than the Atlas V as far as its capabilities are concerned. So why is this a big deal? Well, I'm going to explain everything that Japan intends to do for the Artemis program, something that NASA really doesn't advertise, and why this is going to be so vital to the long-term success of going back to the moon to stay. Because frankly, without the support of these kinds of programs, I really don't think NASA is going to be able to succeed. So this, of course, was an anticlimactic debut for the H-3 rocket, and a lot of people probably weren't even paying a great deal of attention. I mean, what's so exciting about this rocket? It's expendable. There isn't a whole lot of things going on with this rocket that are particularly new or innovative compared to all of the new stuff that SpaceX is doing, or indeed even some of the innovative reusability that ULA is planning to build in to the Vulcan Centaur. Well, to be honest, not a great deal is going on with H3 that is particularly exciting with the exception of one thing, its engines. Japan is attempting to do something with a hydrogen and oxygen fueled engine that's never been done before. As a matter of fact, this type of system has never been attempted on the first stage of any rocket. And this is a process called the expander bleed cycle. Let me try to explain this to you as best as a layman who doesn't really understand rocket science can explain it. The difference between the expander cycle and traditional cycles is it takes the fuel and in other words, the hydrogen, and uses that to cool down the engine's combustion chamber. In the process, the supercooled hydrogen then picks up heat and begins to transfer from a liquid to a gaseous stage, which is something it has to do anyway before it can drive the engine. In addition to that, the fuel then powers the turbine that drives the engine's fuel and oxidizer pumps before being injected into the combustion chamber and burned. This is a very efficient use 
use of propellant. It serves multiple purposes before it finally gets used to drive the rocket. As a result, this engine has some pretty impressive capabilities. We're talking about a third of a million pounds worth of thrust, definitely not as much as Raptor 2 or even Raptor 1. However, the specific impulse is substantially higher, 426 seconds or almost a minute more than the Raptor is capable of. Which is typical of these kinds of engines, hydrogen is the most efficient propellant you can use, although it isn't the most powerful. You don't get as much thrust out of it, hence the need for a more efficient fuel cycle. Now, the second stage is powered by an LE-5B engine, also using hydrogen and oxygen. However, it also has a very high specific impulse of 448 seconds, allowing the second stage to get to some pretty high orbits and also to the moon. Now, if you've read some of the articles that have been released recently about H3, its capabilities don't seem very impressive. You're looking at like eight tons to low Earth orbit or something like that. Well, that's a bit misleading, and I have a feeling that Mitsubishi is actually trying to conceal the real capabilities of this rocket. That's the bottom end of what this thing is capable of lifting if it has no solid rocket boosters, but it can have up to four of them, and its ultimate capabilities at its highest level, that is to say the H324, which has two of the LE9 engines and four solid rocket boosters is six metric tons to translunar injection orbit or TLI. Now we're talking six metric tons to TLI is more than enough to carry a substantial amount of payload out to the lunar gateway, which is one of a number of things that Japan is planning to do with this rocket. Now, as far as low earth orbit capabilities are concerned, one of the most exciting things that H3 is going to be doing is carrying up the Sierra space dream chaser for Asian missions. It has a 5.2 meter fairing, which is capable of carrying the dream chaser. That's one really wonderful thing about that Sierra space spacecraft is its capability to work with just about any rocket that has a fairing that big. But what about the moon? What really is Japan intending to send out to translunar injection? Well, once again, if we're talking about resupply, this is where it comes in very handy to NASA. If Japan foots the bill for lunar resupply, as they've already expressed a willingness to, that is a considerable cost savings to NASA, because even with Falcon Heavy and Dragon XL, which by the way still has not been fully developed yet, handling the job, it's still going to be at least one to two hundred million dollars per mission, possibly more, because keep in mind, the Dragon XL is not a reusable spacecraft. There are are no plans in place to make the Dragon XL capable of carrying payload out to the moon and then return to Earth to be reused, making it a lot more expensive to use Falcon Heavy to resupply the Lunar Gateway. Now, H3 will certainly be more expensive. However, if NASA isn't having to foot the bill, it just doesn't matter. And what is JAXA going to be using to handle this resupply? Well, they've had a resupply ship for some time, and this is the the latest version of it, the HTVX. This is a vehicle not too dissimilar from the Cygnus in many ways, except it's capable of interplanetary travel. It has a height of 8 meters, a diameter of 4.4 meters, and it's capable of carrying quite a lot of payload, over 4 metric tons of pressurized payload and 1.75 metric tons of unpressurized payload. Now, I need to make one thing very clear about this. It means that Japan already has a completed design and almost a completed ship capable of handling resupply, whereas NASA really doesn't yet. Dragon XL has definitely been in development, and I have every confidence that SpaceX will have it ready in time, but JAXA has taken care of a lot of that ahead of time. And also, Elon Musk 
doesn't really want to use Falcon Heavy for lunar resupply anyway. He wants to use Starship. So if you want to handle these small-scale resupply missions, which really is all that Artemis is going to need for quite some time, why not use H3 and the HTVX once again, especially considering that Japan is going to be footing the bill and not NASA. So what else is Japan going to be doing besides resupply missions to the Lunar Gateway? I mean, that doesn't seem to be too ambitious. Well, how about a mobile habitat on the surface of the moon, capable of relocating thousands of kilometers in between missions? When it comes to lunar rovers, NASA is even less well prepared than they are for resupply to the Lunar Gateway. Their concepts for rovers for Artemis 3 and even Artemis 4 are beyond primitive. We're talking very tiny collapsible rovers, as you're looking at right here, only good for traveling a few kilometers away from the landing site. And it's not much of a habitat either. Well, by 2029, Japan plans to put a mobile habitat, again capable of traveling thousands of kilometers between landing sites on the moon. And this thing is indeed a habitat. We're talking 13 cubic meters of habitable space. That's actually bigger than Crew Dragon is. Very impressive. And as I said before, it's going to be capable of traveling between landing sites, meaning that you're only going to need one of these rovers for the entire Artemis program most probably. So how is it capable of doing all of this? Well, for one thing, it recharges its solar batteries on a daily basis. But if you think that Toyota is planning to make this huge lunar cruiser solar powered, well, you're very much mistaken. Toyota isn't that stupid. They know, of course, that the moon doesn't have any sunlight available two weeks out of four, and solar panels are not going to generate a tremendous amount of power anyway. The solar panels are there for supplementary power, the primary power source for this rover is hydrogen fuel cells. And of course, hydrogen is available in abundance on the lunar surface in situ trapped in the lunar ice, at least as far as we know. And the moon cruiser is designed to travel a thousand kilometers on a single load of hydrogen fuel cells. Let me say that again, a thousand kilometers on one load of hydrogen. Very impressive indeed indeed, and also it's capable of driving itself autonomously, which is going to be absolutely necessary for this mobile habitat to relocate itself in between Artemis missions. This is a much more ambitious and much more useful mobile habitat solution than anything NASA currently has in operation. And by the way, did you notice that this thing is 5.2 meters in width, the same size as the H3 fairing? That is no accident, and the length can be carried inside the H3 fairing as well. It's capable of carrying two astronauts in extreme comfort, and by the way, they don't have to be wearing their spacesuits either while they're traveling around inside this thing. For the early missions of Artemis, this is really the only habitat that the astronauts are going to need. Something this size for just a couple of astronauts, or perhaps four astronauts who don't need to travel quite as far, this this is going to be a much more comfortable and efficient solution than anything else that's currently being planned. And as you can see, it can be deployed by the H-3 or by a wide variety of other rockets, including Starship. So this is why I'm so excited about tonight's launch and why I hope to hell it goes well. And that is by no means a sure thing, given the cutting edge nature of the new engines on the H-3. They've had problems before, they could have problems again. I certainly hope that that isn't the case because Japan is openly talking about handling resupply both to the lunar gateway and to the lunar surface for Artemis and to take care of the mobile habitat requirements and they have ambitions beyond that. How could you possibly turn this down? 
saving NASA hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars on Artemis, which is absolutely essential given how ridiculously expensive SLS is. No matter how wasteful or expendable H3 may be, it's way cheaper than SLS. And again, if the Japanese government is willing to foot the bill in order to put their stamp on our legacy of returning to the moon, only a madman would want to turn that down. Smash that like, hit that subscribe. Once again, we are just over 3,800 subscribers away from that magical 100K. Thanks so much for your support, and as always, stay angry about space.